Harvard Divinity School. A home for the human spirit, cultural activism, and the moral imagination in the Inherit Art Project, March 29th, 2022. Okay, I will go ahead with the introduction. Welcome, everyone to our fifth event in our spring semester series, Disrupting Injustice and Promoting Moral Imagination in Israel-Palestine. My name is Hilary Rantisi, and I'm the Associate Director of the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative, which is a program of religion and public life at Harvard Divinity School. I'm also a co-instructor of Narratives of Displacement and Belonging in Israel-Palestine. Our work at the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence, and power, and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for just peace building. The primary case study we're focusing on is on Israel-Palestine, and our aim is to stretch the scholarly discourse around religion and the practices of peace building, and to examine the decolonial potentialities of art, religion, and identity transformation. Our series this semester showcases religion, conflict, and peace fellows and their work. While affiliated with our program, they've all worked on a variety of projects from illuminating transnational solidarities to reimagining Jewish identity supporting Palestinian steadfastness, Sumud, and cultivating moral imagination and creative possibilities for a just peace in Israel-Palestine. Today's event highlights the work of Tarian Webb, who will be presenting on A Home for the Human Spirit, Cultural Activism and the Moral Imagination in the Inherit Art Project. The creation of this exhibit has been his project while a fellow with us, he, we had hoped to have the exhibit on display at Harvard at this time, but unfortunately due to COVID, we haven't been able to have a physical display. So today, instead of that, we will hear about the process behind bringing such a project to life and um, doing so in such a way that centralizes the importance of moral imagination and freedom dreams. So uh, just a brief introduction before we start. Dr. Tarian Webb serves as the director of the Center for the Church and the Black Experience, an instructor of religion and race at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois. At the intersection of Black Studies, Critical Ethnic Studies, Liberationist Theology, and US Religious History, Webb's ongoing research looks at Blackness and Palestinianness as racial formations. He uses visual material culture to uncover how Black and Palestinian communities organically move against white supremacy and Judeo-Christian hegemony. So before we start our event today, just a word of housekeeping. Participants may type in their questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Please don't use a chat, as that will only be used for technical issues. Um, Questions are not visible to other participants. If you prefer that your questions be anonymous and your name not mentioned, then please specify when you write it. We'll also try to ask as many questions posed as possible and apologize if we don't get to all of them by the end of this event. This webinar is being recorded and the video will be available on our website in a few days for viewing. Thank you all for joining us and without further ado, Please, uh, Tarian, take take it take us to the exhibit. Hi, thanks, Hillary. Hey, everybody. Um, so it's really good to be here, and I'm only gonna uh, I wanted to pop in really quickly, briefly, uh, at this time to just give you all a roadmap of of what you can expect uh, to see and experience during our sixty minutes together today. But but before I do that, um, I want to just give a, a quick shout out. I believe my my family is tuning in. Uh, from from all over. So to my, my spouse and our three littles, hey, hey, y'all, hey, mom and dad. Um, it's important to me to always foreground uh, the, the communities uh, without whom our work, my work would not be possible. That's important for my tradition. Um, so in the way of a roadmap, 
After I finish talking in about the next uh, 30 seconds, we're going to be joined by a colleague of mine, a, a uh, faculty colleague of mine here at, at Garrett, uh, Dr. Brian Bantam, who's a professor of, of theology here. And I've invited Brian to give uh, a, a bit of a video preface to our time together. After Brian, I'll come back in with a more uh, a formal introduction of, of the project uh, and, and the exhibit. And immediately following that, we are really, really excited to offer to this audience uh, the, the first ever public viewing uh, premiere of the video trailer that uh, will ultimately roll into the short film project that will, will uh, be, be based on this exhibit that will roll out in 2013. Uh, so after, after my word, we're going to run into the video trailer and then uh, we're going to feature an interview between one of the artists in the show, Luxie Turner. She's a, a Palestinian artist based in Australia. We're going to feature that interview. And then after that, Hillary and I will come back in live uh, and engage in conversation a little bit and hopefully have time to answer some questions. Uh, so, so with that said, I hope you all uh, enjoy. Hello, my name is Brian Bantam, and I am the Neil F. and Isla A. Professor of Theology at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And today it is my pleasure to offer a preface to our time together with Professor Torian Webb. To speak of Blackness in our moment is to speak in tongues. That Pentecost moment when those who loved and followed Jesus gathered in his absence in mourning and grief, with dreams torn asunder, and so many questions of what will come next. In that moment, the spirit fell and confession poured out and the diaspora heard the promises of God in their own language. Grammar broke cadence and sound bent, and language was filled with meaning that outstripped what it was intended to hold. Where Blackness might have begun with invention and violence, it has become something far more. And because of this, Blackness points us to ourselves, to those deep trenches, those folds of beauty to God in new ways. The Pentecostal body that is Black being points to mystery, to multiplicity, to the many and to the one. Blackness is faint echoes or glaring horns of promise and pain in language that is sometimes not our own. We are the texts. We are the songs. In Torian Webb's work today, we are welcomed into a gathering of these varied voices, where race was invented as a means of sorting and categorizing and creating whiteness by trying to submerge itself beneath characteristics of blackness as void and negation like an etching that can only print by removing, by pulling out shards of copper or wood to let its own image rise. But the art that is black flesh and life refuses to be carved out, refuses to be the edges to make another known, to be scraped out in words or epistemologies or classifications. Having experienced his collection and his reflections, I have been struck by the power of material and flesh and spirit, a power that creates and recreates again and again and again. These flashes of Black life, the drums, the dance, the song, the poetry, the beats, the side eye, the yo mama jokes, the tricksters, the preachers, all of this life 
continually fills and overflows those etched grooves that try to erase us. As a theologian, in, these, in this continual Genesis moment, I see tongues of fire, mystery and presence, refrains of love, echoes of I am who I am, and God with us in every new black body born. Where blackness was once storied to be lack, it is in fact fecundity. Painter James Carey Marshall depicts his characters in the deepest hues of black, but far from repeating the faulty epistemologies of whiteness, he reminds us of the material processes that create these hues of black. Black is the combining of the three primary colors, blue, red, and yellow. These three mixing into various strengths and strains to make use of the many, of the multiple, Black is all. To see the sacred not as singular or dogmatic or a universal oneness, we need to see the sacred in the many. But to see this difference, we can look at the blacks from, we can't look at the blacks from a distance. You need to creep close to see the flecks of blue you need to stare and flip from image to image. You need to go from beat to beat, from song to song, to see the clay that the body was drawn from. And if we do, perhaps we begin to see the flecks of love, the flecks of life, of the divine. Perhaps we will also get to see ourselves. And so for this, I'm so thankful for this project in this conversation for the flashes of Black life that will break in today. Thank you very much. So I asked Brian to do something very specific for us as we entree into our time together. I asked him to, to situate us within a decidedly Black cultural idiom, okay, in his own way. More specifically, I wanted him to locate us within a strand of Black religious thought, the Black religious imaginary that invites us into the possibilities of thinking through the body, right, the corporeal, the material flesh, right, in a, in a different type of way, as a type itself of, of sacred text. So what did he do? He, he, he took us from the example of a site more typically perhaps understood as, as a traditional religious text, and he moved us into another, right, into a different way of understanding culture as sacred. And I wanted him to enter us into this conversation through this door, not only because these types of thought exercises have been critical for my own ideological formation, or even because part of the work of the moral imagination is, is, is kind of this refiguring of of bodies from which um, value is usually stripped, right? In, in a social and political sense with uh, kind of re refiguring them and re-imbuing them with these bold postures and bold platforms, right? So I wanted him to enter us into this place, not only because of these reasons, but also because for many of us, who have studied the Black radical tradition, we appreciate the ways that the tradition has historically offered useful tools and, and heuristics 
that other liberationist struggles have sometimes used to, to kind of ac accent their own freedom dreams, right? And while this, while this project and this conversation isn't uh, a move to, to kind of universalize Blackness or Palestinianness or, or exceptionalize them in, in these weird sorts of ways, it, it is an argument for and a project about constantly recasting, right? And recasting and recasting and redeploying how we might imagine what I sometimes call these transnational resonances, right? This is how I enter, how I enter the, the long arc of Black Palestinian transnational solidarity and the shared joys and the shared uh, fears and what my friend and colleague Lubna Katami has, has uh, sometimes uh, called to me the shared griefs across experiences. Certainly since like this 2009 to 2014 window when uh, artists, activists, some scholars, particularly US-based folks, uh, began to, to re-invoke this, this specific transnational linkage, right? this specific solidarity bond in the public consciousness. Certainly since then, there's been no shortage of writings or, uh, or panel discussions or joint pilgrimage trips, immersive trips, focusing on uh, Black Palestinian experience, Black Palestinian activism, uh, histories, potential futures for solidarity, so on and so forth. There's been no shortage of these things. What I wanted to do was, uh, was offer a different kind of entry point for the folks who weren't the specialists, right? For the organizations who were not the content experts on the region. For the Black U.S. religious communities who, who never heard of Palestine, didn't know where to find it on a map. For the Arab elders at the community centers or, or the Black grandmamas down the block who weren't thinking about Black Palestinian, uh, nothing, no time, right? I wanted to offer them a place to enter, yes, hoping that when they saw people who reminded them of themselves and their aunties and their sisters and their grandmamas and their cousins, right? That, that they'd begin to see humanity a bit more broadly, a bit more capaciously, as well as race and religion and all these, the, these vectors, right? Gender, all these vectors that, um, that we sometimes think we understand. So I gathered about 15 artists, visual artists, from both the African diaspora and the Palestinian exilic migration together into a visual arts exhibition that uses portraiture as a way to reflect on the relationship between humanity and the sacred. Uh, the, the point of course being uh, to, to reimagine bodies and cultures themselves as, as sacred. As Brian said, uh, our texts, our songs, our dance, uh, we are the texts, we are uh, the songs, we are the, the sacred scripts and, and scriptures, as you'll hear looks say, uh, before time and after time. So here I offer uh, this audience a bit of a sneak peek into the, into the larger virtual suite uh, of this exhibit project. So in addition to a few uh, more tour locations, we have we will have interviews with artists available. One of them you'll see today that was, that was filmed in my office here on campus uh, that I think perfectly captures uh, the, the themes that I have sought to, to string across the entire project. We also have a video trailer that you all will see momentarily and a, uh, and a short film uh, that we plan to release in 2023. Uh, so with that, please enjoy the following two visual experiences 
Um, and after that, Hillary and I will return for a wrap up conversation. conversation. Can you just introduce yourself, say a little bit about what you do? Um, yeah, my name is Lux and I was born in Australia of Palestinian heritage to um, my father Jacob Zakak and my mother Vera Shine, who are both from um, Haifa and Yaffa respectively. I guess my work here has brought me here specifically addressing my Palestinian heritage. Uh, and the work, how it situates itself within the Palestinian diaspora um, globally, which is, it's a very nice time to be connecting with others in. Um, here I am at Northwestern in this beautiful exhibition, namely Inherit the Earth, Faces of the Divine, and really excited about having conversations with other artists and yours truly, <laughs> Dr. Webb here. Um, yeah, about what this means, what, what it means to bring art into these sacred spaces and out the sacred texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So, so kind of in, in line with that, so as you know, at university here, I teach race and religion. And for me, part of what that means I'm interested in is, is kind of thinking through how sacred texts um, function as, as vehicles uh, by which communities across a number of different traditions are, are able to, to chronicle right? mm. or, or, or mark time or capture whatever the moment is that, that they're trying to capture. So to, to me, this show, this exhibition, understands creative culture, artistic production are doing a similar type of capturing. So can you say a little bit about um, how, to your mind, your work kind of engages the work of chronicling or marking time or capturing a moment? Mm. Um, I think it's, it definitely speaks to being in the diaspora um, and how that, that is quite different from my parents' experience. Um, they're definitely markers of time. I also like to work with time in such a way that, you know, I think about before time and, you know, beyond time. Like, what, what does that look like? What does it look like for this work to exist in the now? But also, what if somebody was to find this work, you know, 50 years from now, yeah. 2,000 years from now? What would it say about us? Um, what story would it tell? What insight would it give? Um, so I think inadvertently works are always chronic, like yeah, chronicles and markers of time. Um, but I also think it's interesting to you know think about time when making the work. Like you know, what's the future of this work, and what's the past? You know, what's the the resonant history of this? How did it come to be? You know, what's its context as well? So they, they give a lot, when you think about time, it gives a lot of information. Um, and then when combined with sacred texts, you know, a lot of the time, I mean, we're talking about time, but for me, I guess, things that are sacred are timeless. Mm. And they transcend those different spaces. It becomes non-linear. You know, it lives in this kind of circular arc or even more than circular. You know, it kind of exists in many different dimensions and planes and you know, because it's even though the work that, you know, has brought me here is specifically commenting on my Palestinian heritage and the diaspora in which it situates itself, it's, um, you know, it, it's, 
it, it still works on in other fields. It still works in other levels, um, mm -hmm. in other places. Um, like it works in the decolonial sphere. You know, what works in works that are co about connection to land as well. Um, yeah, so it, there's, it, the, there's always this kind of sense of expansion and I don't know if I'm getting a bit quantum here <laughs> or like the no, physics no, no. of time and space, but it, it opens up so much more and I think when you deliberate about time, past, mm -hmm. present, future and beyond and think about how your work is situated in that, it yeah. then leads you to ask other questions and yeah. connect, make different connections. Yeah, yeah, I mean there, there's, there's so much here. Right. So, looks. You mentioned that you're Palestinian, right? And 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 that you kind of situate your own work. You understand your own work as as speaking specifically through kind of that that idiom. One thing that you know is important for the show. I wanted to be really deliberate and intentional about including um, not only voices from from the African diaspora, but doing so alongside Palestinian voices, Palestinian artists, mm. right? because that type of transnationalism mm. and transnational discourse is important to me. Can you, can you talk about, say a little bit more about, um, just frame for us how you understand a larger kind of racial or ethnic mm. uh, story or art that, mm. you, that you try to situate your work within? It's, um, that question is really interesting because a, a lot of the time, like while listening to you say these things, it, was a, it comes from a deeply personal place. Mm. And it wasn't until I made the work that it then connects you in, in this really kind of macrocosmic realm of other cultures who, um, and people whose plight and experience has been very similar. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this work was very much about trying to understand my parents and their, their traumas. And, yeah. you know, always trying to make sense of growing up on a, on a land that wasn't really, it didn't make sense to me. Um, I mean, the land itself did, but culturally I felt very out of place, um, not knowing where to, to fit in. And, you know, I, I had this dress, which, you know, in my mother's wardrobe, and, mm -hmm. you know, that, that expression on my face is also kind of similar to my father as well. There was, I've, I've always carried this sense of displacement. I couldn't, quite, um, I couldn't quite figure out what to do with, you know, and I've traveled a lot, and everywhere feels like home, but nowhere feels like home. Yeah. There's, constant seeking, searching in, in terms of a home. And I think that that's an, almost an epigenetic and, you know, mm -hmm. he heredity, you know, her sorry, <laughs> hereditary kind of thing. Like I've inherited that from my father. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't until I made this work that it, that, you know, then opened up a new door and connected me to all this massive Palestinian diaspora, mm -hmm. mainly in the, you know, the Australia, US mm -hmm. kind of connection. Um, but, you know, it, given the recent events in the last couple of years with Black Lives Matter and, you know, people really starting to want the decolonial, decolonial practice to start, it's, yeah. it's, it's coming into the forefront of a lot of discussion. Um, and that's stuff I'm really interested in. So back in Australia, you know, not having necessarily identified with a lot of the, the Anglo-Australian culture, I looked to, you know, First Nations. I looked because they understood the land, they had a relationship yeah. with the land. And, you know, Palestinians have a very profound relationship with the, the land, they're agrarian by nature. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, now coming through into the US, it's connecting me with a lot of the African American history and experience past, present and emerging as well. And I think we, we need each other to be part of this dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look at future decolonial practices, we look at, we look at the decolonial dialogue and conversation that we're having now, we cannot have it in separate vacuums, I think we do need to come together. Um, you know, and it's, there's been many, many journeys over lands over years, going back to this mm -hmm. question of time. Mm -hmm. I also think that unites us, you know, that journey of land and time has been one of loss. Whereas for, you know, the, on the other hand, it's been a journey of overland and time to gain and exploit. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting dichotomy. Um, but how do we move beyond that? You know, and I, I mentioned to you, like I, I really stopped about a year ago using words such as people of color, you know, and I, I, I call them people of the global majority because we are, there's actually more of us. And, and what does that look like? Where's the power in that for us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, wanna, uh, I wanna spend a little bit of time here just asking you more about like, this question of time. We, we've talked about this, you know, quite a lot and, and we've picked it up. Mm. Um, in several other venues, I think you also kind of pull some of these threads in your in your artist statement. 
but I'm remembering the moment just just uh, a little while ago when you invoked uh, your piece that that's with us in the show, and I, and I think it was in your artist statement you talk about what it means for you in the self-portrait to stand in a colonial landscape, um, invoking a strained colonial past, uh, standing in a strained present, mm -hmm. and, and no doubt surely looking towards a strained future. So can you, can you talk a little bit about how you as a Palestinian artist kind of wrestle with and grapple with ideas of the future? Mm -hmm. Right and and um, kind of what that what that means, what that looks like, what that shouldn't look like. Can you say a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Those are, those are really good questions. Um, this this expression of standing in a landscape. I mean, the, the landscape is is you know officially it's you know First Nations. It's mm -hmm. it's you know Darug Nation. Yeah. Um, but the way it has been canonized in art mm -hmm. by you know settler colonial painters. It's always kind of gives off this image that it's a very colonial landscape. Um, so it was interesting positioning myself in Palestinian or you know traditional garb in that landscape. It's 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 about sense making, and for, for me there was a I guess that strained expression came from you know one colonized land, one displaced land is begets another. Like it's this constant kind of repetition of it. You know, my parents only ended up there because of what happened back home. You know, sure. I, I think most people wouldn't leave their countries if the conditions were okay. You know, sure. people love their home. Um, so I guess that's where the, the context of that expression comes from. But, you know, even, I and mean, then we'll probably talk about this again, the, the posturing and, you know, this looking into a distant or not so distant future. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me at the time, I'm like, well, where, where is home? You know, what does that even look like? How, how do I even think about a home when there's still so much trauma, you know, and in, you know, this lack of reconciliation in, on the land that I live and on the land that my parents had to leave as well. So it's almost like, you know, there needs to be some kind of healing mm -hmm. that takes place. And, um, you know, in the political sphere, how hard is that, you know, <laughs> to, and we were talking about entering these spaces where we can actually change policy, legislation, yeah. protocol, that's one avenue. Um, but steering into the second half of your question, the other avenue for me, for me I guess, is about creating new narratives, you know, and it's assuming my position almost energetically almost in an image that I create, mm -hmm. not somebody creates of me and tells yeah. me how to, yeah. you know, yeah. pose and stand. A type of agency we've talked about, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. It's, it's taking our agency back over the images that we create and where we insert ourselves mm -hmm. in and how, how we are. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, the Palestinian thorb on, on that landscape does look out of place in some, in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, but we're here now, you know? It's, yes. This is the way it is. We're not going to be able to send people back and go, okay, well, this is your land. So what does it mean for us to exist in these, you know, different mm -hmm. manifestations of migrations and diaspora? What does that look like? And mm -hmm. yeah, so I guess that there is that expression of, of looking as more questioning, I guess, at this stage, mm -hmm. you know, how is it going to work for us? But while we ask those questions, you know, I still want to be able to put myself where I want to. I want yes. to put myself energetically in a place where I'm standing comfortably on my own. Yes. Um, in the way that I want to, not, you know, like I said, exoticized or fetishized sure, or others. Sure, sure, sure. You know, but yeah, yeah. So a lot of creatives, myself included, spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which creative culture and the arts cross a number of different mediums the visual, the literary, the performative, right? mm. dance, musical, help us in our communities imagine different sorts of possibilities imagine different sorts of worlds, other futures. Um, how does artistic expression mm. for you, and I guess this is more of a, more of a, uh, of an arts practice question. So this, this, this is about like your, your practice as a discipline, mm. right? How does artistic expression help, help you imagine different sorts of possibilities for existing? Mm. Um, I mean, 
that practice is a discipline. Um, there is this kind of regularly having to come back to it um, and look at it through the same lens for a period of time, but then also take time away, reset, and come back to it and look at it through a different set of eyes, lenses, you know, senses. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's it. Like I think I mentioned this before, maybe about form making. Like it's it's yeah. a, just it's a form of you know. I mean, it's very cliche, but it's creation. Mm -hmm. It's creating image. It's creating story. It's creating things in almost the ether of the mm. collective psyche of us. Maybe it's not even you know. I I, I always say it's not even me. You know, mm -hmm. it's not my work, it's a work, it's the work that kind of comes through me. Mm -hmm. um, so the practice for me is also, is also about this embodied practice of making myself a conduit, making myself a channel mm -hmm. for, for work to come through. You know, like this work that's featuring in this show was, like I said, it almost felt accidental. It was just, it was very instinctive. You know, mm -hmm. one day I just took the camera and I took the, the dress and I went walking. Wow. Um, but you know the regular yeah. practices of embodiment, of um, tuning in, of being present. I think you know having a regular practice, a regular discipline of that, opened me up to be able to go. Okay, well, I'm just not going to think about what I'm doing today. I'm just going to do it and see what mm -hmm. comes out of it. So yeah. there's a bit of a, a dance between those two. Sure. There's an oscillation between the discipline of practice, um, the discipline of you know for me it's embodied skill, embodied practice, mm -hmm. and presence, so that I'm ready. You know, when something does call me, or I, you know, there's a lack of routine, for example, that I can actually dance with that for a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking about. Um, I'm thinking about how you represent the human form, mm -hmm. right? In, in in this in this work in particular, can you say a little bit about what? Is there something unique that, that portraiture as form offers us that, that other artistic genres cannot? Mm. Yeah, um, definitely the, I think for me, given that the portrait that I've, I've showcased features the entire body as opposed to a typical sure. portrait, which is just the, the bust, probably connects to my focus on embodiment and how the body is a part of the landscape and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important not to sever, you know, that body-mind connection, that body-mind land. You know, there's a psyche in the land that is us as well. Um, so for me, I, I guess that that human spirit is even bigger mm -hmm. than we give attention to. You know, it does. It's, it's a bigger space. It's contextual. It uh, goes back to these markers of time as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, it holds that that moment, that zeitgeist, the, you know, what's mm -hmm. happening, the questions at that time, how it connects to land and place and sight. There's a, there's a lot of information as well. You know, humans are like multifaceted beings, such like, you know, like everything is. We don't sure. just engage on this level, we engage on several different levels. Sure, sure. So it's, um, I mean, you, you actually asked me that question about, you know, the portrait being this house of the spirit almost yes. you know this sacred text of the spirit and I've never thought about it that way until mm -hmm. you know our discussions mm -hmm. and you know I mean even the title of the exhibition you know faces mm -hmm. of the divine to start seeing that in us again is I think it's a really crucial dialogue to be having at the moment yes because we've forgotten you know we've commodified ourselves we've been seduced by the image of ourselves rather than the spirit yes. um, so I think coming back to portraiture is probably a really, you know, it, it's it's an expansive avenue for looking at how we capture and house and present the spirit of a human. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. One thing that, that immediately strikes me about your work uh, is, again, I, I talked about you know, a moment ago, like how we represent the human form. But I think about these ideas of, of dignity and honor mm. and worth. You know, when I look at your work, and I think this is the case with a number of other artists in, in the show, when I look at when I look at these works, and when I look at your work, I feel like I'm not just looking at uh, like these uh, these nondescript, um, detached subjects, mm -hmm. like arranged rather randomly. I feel like I'm I'm looking at subjects that intentionally or not kind of exude the sense of 
of dignity, of worth, of agency. Mm. So the, the question is, is, is that something that's, that's intentional in your work, something that you're intentionally trying to, to capture and recast, or is that you know, more, more accidental? Mm. I would say that's definitely intentional. That mm -hmm. was something I felt and I still feel very strongly about when I work with image making, whether it's still or moving. Um, and I did touch on this briefly, but um, you know, what, having worked in commercial photography and you know, watching the dynamics of how people are posed, especially yeah. with you know, fashion photography and things like that, sure. you know, that, that kind of hunched over, that yeah, real yeah. wafy, weak, weakling mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then you know, the, the othering of you know, women that weren't necessarily, I'm talking fashion because I was working mainly with female subjects, um, but women that weren't necessarily you know, like Anglo or white, they, they were, they were fetishized, they were othered. You know, I'd contact modeling agencies to get a model and there was always one token black person, one token Asian person, I mean, even sure. one token freckled redhead, you know, that's sure. how it was. Sure. Um, but then, you know, when you see the dynamics at play in the, photo, you know, the photography process, it's, you know, again, it was this person who was directing someone how to pose and I didn't really ever like the way mm -hmm. people were posed, there was a weakness there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, and then it was at the time I started reading Edward Said's Orientalism, which I still haven't got through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was uh, one of the many books I've got to get through. But a lot of it did resonate about this othering, you know, about the West looking into the, the you know, Eastern or non-Western cultures with that lens of, sure. you know, oh, look at this thing. Um, so for me, about, you know, grabbing my own camera and taking my own photo, and then when I took photos of other subjects in that series, it was about interviewing them for an extensive period of time and asking them how they want to be seen, how they want to be mm -hmm. represented. So I wasn't just posing them the whole time. Mm -hmm. It was about giving them agency yeah. and you know, authoring their own image creation, their own media on themselves so that yes. they can say that I want to look this way. I want people to see me this way. Yes, yes. Um, you know, and, and as I was saying, it's, it's really important that you know, people from the global majority get back behind the camera, just like with the pen, you know, just like with screen media, lens-based media, because we get to create the narratives of ourselves and how we are seen, how we want to be seen. Mm -hmm. You know, and the thing with dignity is, dignity really, like, it's about holding your own, it's about holding space. It's also about holding the present moment um, and reclaiming history. Yes. Because a lot of the time, history is not told through our experience. Yes. Um, it's not told through our, our lens. Yes. So, you know, when you, when you inhabit that, that resolve in, in your person, in yourself, and that even through posturing, physical posturing, right. it's, it definitely is about reclaiming right. one's divinity, that, you know, right. through dignity. Right, 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 right. I mean, I think there very much is something to be said there about uh, posture and body comportment as as a form of resistance mm. right? I think that's I think that's significant um, we're kind of rounding the final corner here one uh, one question I'm, I'm curious to hear you reflect on who are the the persons and what are the communities uh, to to which your work is accountable mm. um. I guess, you know, like I said, this one, this work was a little bit more accidental. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of followed my instinct that day and then this work kind of was born out of that. Um, and it instantly connected me to the Palestinian diaspora more so globally than it has back home. Mm -hmm. So I do feel, sure. like I've always felt like, you know, you want to help and do something but you just never know how. So through this work of, you know, the Decolonizing the Gaze series, which is, it's an ongoing series, Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to continue photographing more subjects and developing this into a book at some point. Um, but I do, I feel it's, it's a way of creating a new avenue for people who live in the Palestinian diaspora and you know, other diasporas as well to, to see it as a process work that they can apply themselves to mm -hmm. taking the agency back over how they create media, how media is created about them. Um, any community that arises from these shared exhibitions, from shared dialogue, I feel like there is a responsibility to, yeah. to tend to those relationships because um, out of those new connections, that's, you know, great ideas come, sure. you know, even more dialogue comes, possibly, sure. you know, the provocations of, of new processes and practices mm -hmm. that, you know, we can scaffold off in the future. Sure. 
So those interchanges, I think, are really important, and we need to create space and serve, and serve the people that come in to create these interchanges and sure. yeah, allow allow that to expand and and evolve in its own way, but sure. through through community. Sure. So community is massive as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that. So as a final word, um, is there anything that you would leave us with in terms of uh, your hopes, dreams, aspirations about how your work will live in the world? Mm. Um, I mean, at this point in my life, I feel really lucky. Like, I've, I feel like I've, I'm doing what I came here to do, if that yeah. makes sense. It does. Um, and I feel like every day I just have to keep doing, you know, another bit towards it, another bit towards it, and I'll just keep doing doing that. I'm also at a stage in my life where I'm just trying not to strive and, you know, strive and seek too much. It's about mm -hmm. leaving myself open and present to what may emerge. It's that emergence sure. aspect of it. So I can also serve that. Um, I'm really interested in more so the processes at the moment. Mm -hmm. So everything driven by embodiment, about slowing down, about connecting to land, about creating community as an economy as opposed to economy. Yeah. Um, you know, how can we look at these artistic practices, these kind of collaborative and collective engagements, these pro-social engagements mm -hmm. as a framework that we can build upon in the future as we can, you know, so we can see art as um, new world making. I'm really interested in this at the moment. So it's probably opening up, opening me up more to the collaborative nature of work, to the community and pro-social aspect of, of art making. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much, Lux, for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a real privilege and an honor. Thank you for bringing me here. Wow. That was wonderful. Thank you, uh, Tari. And what a wonderful introduction to the exhibit. I, um, I love the focus in your interview with Lux on helping our communities imagine different possibilities and futures as well as agency in creating new narratives. Um, at Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, um, we talk a lot about cultural activism and moral imagination, understanding that moral imagination inherently requires creative arts, creative acts. And um, we also talk about cultural activists that embrace creativity to make visible structural violence uh, in their lived realities and how to imagine a more just world they're actively seeking to transform. So I, I loved uh, also how Lux talked about her decolonizing the gaze series um, yeah. and what you shared with us exemplifies an embodiment of the moral imagination yeah. that we, we often talk about. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have just a few minutes, but I thought maybe, um, you know, I have a few questions for you and we'll be taking some questions from the audience. But one is, I was wondering if you could share with us how uh, this project hopes to nuance the way that Black Palestinian that transnational solidarity is engaged within communities, both uh, in the US and in the academy. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for for that for that question, Hillary. You know, part of the part of the challenge in in preparing for for this kind of capstone presentation is, you know, we we have a lot of stuff that uh, about which the task was trying to think about what can dis what we can distill in a way that will capture the heart of, of the project. So as, as my team and I were kind of sifting through a bunch of stuff, the interviews in, in particular, we have about 10 artist interviews. Um, it, it worked out in such a way that, that I, I ultimately felt like this interview with, with Lux in, in particular, just so perfectly crystallized a number of the, the themes that we see kind of coming up across uh, the, the responses and engagements of, of different uh, different artists. So, so I'm hoping that um, you know th this this was usefully representative. You know, for whatever for whatever that that's worth. But in terms of nuancing the the work, so so some of this in, in a in a particular way, this question was really at the heart of what I've always imagined this project to be. So I've been engaged uh, in kind of both both like the, the 
kind of movement for Black Lives as well as the international movement for solidarity with people of Palestine kind of movements um, and the nexus of those movements really directly since 2012, 2013 or so. Uh, my scholarship and my writing came a couple a couple years later, around 2015, 2016, what, what we began to see, uh, what, what I began to see. So a lot of kind of my, my corner of the vineyard, so to speak, kind of within, within that, that movement has to do with um, engaging particularly Black U.S. religious communities, um, particularly Christian, but not necessarily so, uh, who are interested in kind of awareness raising and or engaging questions of Palestine justice and how that's a particularly urgent um, uh, kind of category community to, to be working with, given, you know, the, the profound, um, frankly, intervention of the, the, the Christian right uh, and, and a number of Zionist communities in, in the U.S. kind of intervention in, into that demographic in particular. So I really wanted to kind of make my home in uh, kind of Black religious spaces and conversations interested in, in kind of engagement on this question of, of Palestine. But part of what we were seeing, you know, a few years ago, and, and this is a bit of a harsh characterization, so take this you know, loosely, but whereas around kind of 2014, 2015 or so, you know, there, there were a lot of the, um, a lot of delegations were popping up, panels, conversations that were kind of starting to talk anew about these transnational linkages, right? So, you know, are there resonances in terms of the hyper-militarized policing that's happening, you know, in, uh, in, in both, in both communities, both communities being kind of Black U.S. experience um, and experiences of Palestinians in, um, uh, in, in, in region, uh, both the, the the West Bank as well as Israel proper, um, you know. So, what are we talking about in terms of, you know, realities of militarized policing? What are we talking in terms of uh, resonances with kind of the uh, the the hardware kind of of, of the occupation, um, uh, weaponry, uh, anti riot gear? You know, what are resonances there in terms of manufacturers, like corporate manufacturers? What are the resonances in terms of the ways in which juveniles are kind of trapped into the, the uh, respective carceral systems. Yeah. Uh, what are the resonances in terms of different assaults on sacred space, right? So we can, yeah. we, we, the, we were anchoring in these, in these different sites that again, are, we're not, we're not identical, right? But, but, you know, that felt, felt oddly familiar, right? So you have this moment in 2014, 2015, 2016 or so, when there were a lot of conversations popping up with folks were saying, oh, you know, Similarities here, differences there, similarities here. But as, as the time progressed, right around, uh, I, I was feeling in 2018, 2019, as we were kind of approaching pandemic years, um, a, a number of, of activist kind of circles, communities I was, was in, were beginning to, to say things and write things about, you know, those, Kind of drawing those loose similarities and linkages that was that was useful three or four years ago mm. right at, at this point we need to start to move into something a little bit deeper right so it's cool to go on a delegation and a pilgrimage but you know what happens what's the infrastructure we are building post pilgrimage post immersion experience that that will really lend itself to the building of deep sustainable sustained relationships that kind of go, mm -hmm. goes beyond this, this superficial level. And it was mm -hmm. out of those series of questions that I started to think about a different, you know, a, a different way to, to nuance the, the entry point. It means something. And it meant something to me to, to have, um, you know, Black communities, religious and not in the U.S., say some version of, we see why this question of Palestine is important. We, we see why it's important, you know, I guess. But the, the, the urgency of, of black life and black concerns are not allowing us to really spend time looking globally. So it was at that point that, that, that I, I tried to pivot in terms of my focus um, and as opposed to kind of going into communities talking about kind of the, the, the harsh realities of the occupation, harsh realities of black life in the US under siege, what might it look like to give folks a different type of, of, of entry point, mm. um, you know, that, that, that tries to center kind of the humanness 
in a, in a different sort of way. So it's kind of out of that, that, that is the space that gave rise to what I, what I hope uh, is one response to, to how do we further, how do we further nuance? So it says that when I go into black religious communities, right on the South side of Chicago and, and, and we put the works on display that are representing people, like bodies of different hues that look, they look familiar to folks and they draw closer and that drawing closer allows them to ask questions about, huh, who is this? What are they about? Where, where are they? Where are they from? How that might be able to open up a different type of window for us to think about humanity a little bit, a little bit more deeply and broadly. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we have one broad question and one just more of a statement, I think. But before I move to that, I just wanna sort of have an opportunity for you to let us know where we can find information about where the exhibit is gonna be up at, because I know it's touring in different types, different places in the US. And so um, if, if uh, you could let us know, I'm assuming it's, it's on your website, the Inherit website, but if you could uh, let us know where we could get that information. And also you mentioned you're making a film and I'm assuming the film is a compilation of interviews with all the different artists that are, so that's something to look forward to. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, are you gonna say a brief word about that real quickly? Yeah, or just yeah. is it is a, is it the website where we can get more information? Yeah, yeah. the 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 quickest uh, the the best way is following the project on on IG on Instagram. Uh, inherit underscore exhibit twenty two is is the handle. Inherit underscore exhibit two two. Um, that that's kind of where where we're housing. Uh, particularly a number a number of the, the photos. So if you're interested in actually looking at the works more more specifically, uh, there we're also gonna gonna start to upload some some of the videos. You're right, Hillary. We we are um, the the film that uh, we plan to to drop in 2023 is going to be kind of a compilation of of the journey of the exhibit, including everything from uh, artist interview snippets from artist interviews. Um, B-roll footage, you know, from uh, from uh, different opening venues, as well as some artist studio B-roll, um, as well as um, there's some there's something else I'm, I'm missing. A couple a couple other things we're going to end up rolling into the into the short film. Um, in terms of uh, tour location, so we're we're still up here in in Chicago at Northwestern. Uh, Northwestern University, we had some opening events, two opening events earlier th this month. We're up here uh, for about another another week or so. Uh, we we will be at the, the Palestine Museum US. Uh, we'll, we'll be at uh, UC Berkeley a little bit later, later on in the fall. Um, uh, we have a stop in Atlanta as well as in, in Pittsburgh. Um, but but that the the uh, specific sites you can find on uh, the Instagram account, as well as our project website. The, the, so the, the project website is where we're going to archive all of the, the full length interviews, as well as the other things uh, that we don't have space to roll into the, the short film. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm afraid that we are out of time. We, we don't have a lot of questions, uh, but we will share them with you so you can follow up with um, the attendees directly if you choose. So we will share those questions. Uh, in the meantime, I think we will close off here with a trailer of the uh, exhibit. Um, and we hope that as many people that can see it will in any location they can access. Thank you so much, uh, Arian, for Thanks, your Hillary. being with us. And thank you for everyone who attended.
Sponsor, Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.